you'll, you'll uh, hold down this row and follow Mr. Lee. This one. We'll work on that another time. Our kids are the future of the ministry. I uh, would encourage you to find out who each of them are, know their names, and pray for them. And honestly, someday you're going to see God using them. They literally are going to grow up and serve the Lord Jesus if we put into them uh, the things that we're responsible for. We're supposed to teach the next generation. They're going to teach the, the generation after that. I pray God gives me several generations worth of teaching in the ministry. But it is a wonderful thing to see a young person grow up and just sometimes be amazed at where they came from and where they are. And uh, I, I could tell stories all day of young people that God has just allowed to come into our ministry that are just in a place that you'd never think possible because of what God has done. Would you uh, get to know each of our kids to find a couple of them, talk to them, pray for them. Are they really singing out this morning? Do you hear how good they sounded? They're really singing these songs. It's just a wonderful thing. And we're looking forward to it. I, no one probably ever taught you how to behave in church. You probably grew up and went to services and so forth, and you just picked up and you learned some things. And so sometimes when you think, well, they're making a lot of noise, or they're doing a lot, well, it's because they're in that learning process. They have to be taught. And sometimes we as adults... Sometimes we have habits, and we do things uh, that we have to learn as well. Uh, it hasn't happened in a long time, but I remember a while in our ministry where we just got this habit where our people would get up right in the middle of preaching and go back to the drinking fountain and get a drink. And any time a person does that, I understand where you're choking or you, you know, you're going to die of dehydration and fall into the aisle or something like that, but you've got to have water. You know, It's an emergency, but I mean everybody had an emergency. One person stand up. Everybody look at them while they're standing up, and then they walk to the drinking fountain. And they get, uh, we even had people, they'd get cups, you know, get, go in the cabinet and get a cup and then start filling it up during the service. And it's just like, what are you thinking? Well, exactly. You're not thinking, you know. And it's the hardest question to answer, isn't it? You ever done something and later on you think, what was I thinking? I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to say, did your mom ever say, what were you thinking? And then, tell me, what were you thinking? That's the way my mom put it. What were you, except she shrieked. It was more of a shrill sound than the way I put it. But, what were you thinking? Tell me, what were you thinking? And I think she shook me when she was doing it, too. It seems like, anyway. I'm not supposed to shake a child, or maybe it's a baby. Anyway. I never had a good question, or a good answer to that question. Did you? Never was able to answer that question. Speaking of behavior, you may notice uh, when someone sings a special in our church, uh, sometimes people clap. Sometimes people don't clap. Normally in our church, we don't clap. And the reason is because it's worship. And so when we, when we worship the Lord Jesus, we're singing about Him. And God's amazing. And sometimes the people represent us so well when they sing that they, you know, we feel like, wow, that was great. You know, that was, that's what I wanted to sing and we clap for it. But sometimes also that translates into, wow, you guys did a good job. And we, we're not, we don't really commend people for doing a good job worshiping Jesus, actually. So you may wonder, like, you, you know, you may see the kids are all clapping because they're used to going to performances and you're supposed to clap if it's good, if it's terrible, whatever. It's polite to clap, and so they're being polite. But you may notice uh, the pastor doesn't clap when somebody uh, does a special. And the reason is because it isn't a performance. Uh, so we're not lauding a person. We're actually... Uh, worshiping Jesus, and if somebody really does that well, uh, I've found that sometimes even while they're singing, man, sometimes I just I say, man, amen, you know, that's what I want, amen, and so be it, or verily, truly, that's what I wanted to say myself, so you could express yourself that way, I'm not, I'm not telling you to or not to, I'm not even, I don't even have a really an opinion about folks clapping, but if you wonder why some folks clap, some don't, it's because we've thought through it, and I think that clapping for a person doing a special in church, I've noticed that oftentimes it's proportionate to the quality of the special or sometimes the cuteness of the person, if it's a child, that performs. And, and uh, that's a distraction because it isn't about them, it's about Jesus. And so we just want to reflect upward. You may have noticed that in some churches, 
uh, that the pastor sits on the platform. And uh, a lot of times there's chairs, like I've been to churches, and I mean, it's like they look like thrones that they have up on the platform. And we don't do that in our church either. And it's because I'm against folks that do it. But we did deliberately a long time ago determine, you know what, we don't have special people. We don't have people, we don't lift people up. And I believe in uh, reverencing a pastor and so forth, but we do not worship people either. We worship Jesus. And so we just want to be deliberate about what we do. It isn't a commentary on what anyone else in the world does. But that's, that's why you may wonder, why does pastor, you know, not have a, a fancy chair and sit up front or a guest speaker sit up front? It's because we're just people. And we don't want there to be a gap or uh, like where people feel like there's a disconnect between the people that God uses because God just uses ordinary people. And uh, that's, that's all we are. And so, I, again, I'm just mentioning some things this morning because I feel led to do so. And I have mentioned those same things from time to time before so that... Folks that have been coming for a long time are like, why is he saying that again? But you've never heard it, so you know why. Maybe you could tell them. Matthew chapter 9. Are you there? Matthew chapter 9 this morning. And we're going to go down to uh, verse, verse 10. We're going to read that portion of the Scripture, and, and then we're going to, going to jump down to verse 36 as well. So if you found verse 10... Here's a little antidote, or not antidote, a little anecdote, antidote. Okay, let me stop. Tell a story. I use the word antidote for anecdote. Uh, the kids are work, working on their scripture and memory this last week, and they're learning, This book of the law shall not depart from out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. One of our kids said, This book of the law shall not depart from out of thy mouth, but thou shalt medicate therein day and night. So I've been singing, you know, there's a... In, in our car, we've got sung scripture songs. I've been singing Medicaid. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt medicate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to. Anyway, it's cute. But uh, actually, when you think about it, hey, that's the best medicine you can get. It's the Word of God, right? So medicate therein day and night, and it'll be better than the other stuff you're taking. <laughs> okay. Anecdote, a story about what Jesus did, verse 10. It came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let's go to verse 36 and let's read another one. Uh, the Bible says, uh, When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Okay, so let's pray and ask the Lord as we look at these uh, two portions of this text, which is full of similar accounts that, that show us a snapshot of who Jesus was. Let's pray that God will help us to know Jesus better as a result of what we learned today. Father, please help us to learn today. Help us to find the truth that's in the Scripture. And, and God, I pray that as a result, we would have a better look, a better glimpse into your heart. I pray that as a result of that, we would better know how you want us to live in light of it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 32 times in the Gospel of Matthew, the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is mentioned. The kingdom of heaven. Uh, 32 times. And so I would say that much of what Matthew saw about Jesus had to do with the kingdom of heaven or what Jesus said the kingdom of heaven was. Hi, Mario. Good morning. Uh, so, that's a major emphasis. Now, when I look at the kingdom of heaven, I study and look in the scripture, and I see that 
there are a couple of kingdoms that are mentioned in the Bible, and they're not all the same. The kingdom of Israel, for instance, is not the kingdom of heaven. Let's, let's don't be um, overly scientific or silly about it, but let me ask you just a practical question. Where is heaven? Where is heaven? Nobody knows. Not earth, right? Yeah, so we say, uh, you know, the Jerusalem would be the city of the north. Okay, where is, where is God? We say He is in the heavens or heaven. But heaven is just a word that means above the earth. Now, the earth is round in spite of some famous people that uh, debate that nowadays. So, which direction from earth? We're on opposite sides, you know, of the earth. So, the question is, where? It, when the Bible talks about heaven, is it talking about space, outer space, or above the earth? Well, I know, not specifically, it's talking about an economy of the place where God is, who is in the heavens. So, the Bible talks about the kingdom of heaven. It's talking about the kingdom that is God's economy. God's kingdom. And it is spoken of in Matthew as a contemporary uh, concept. In other words, we know that before Jesus was raised from the dead, before he, uh, before he had come back from the dead, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say before he was raised from the dead, we know that before Jesus died on the cross, that when people died, they actually went, we believe, to the center of the earth where hell is. Because the Bible describes, if you read Luke 16, for instance, the Bible describes uh, that there's paradise and that there's hell and that there's a great gulf or a division between the two. And actually, you could see from, he from paradise, or we, another word for paradise would have been Abraham's bosom, you could actually see from hell to paradise. That's pretty amazing. And you remember the story of Lazarus talking to Abraham and saying, you know, uh, uh, the rich man, not Lazarus, but he's talking to the rich man and saying, you know, send Lazarus to tell my brothers. Send Lazarus uh, to, uh, you know, if I could just have a drop of water to cool my tongue. So we know hell is a real physical place. We believe it's in the center of the earth. The Bible says that hell hath enlarged itself. And so when Jesus died on the cross, one of the things that the Bible says happened was that immediately the graves were opened and the saints came out of the graves. Came out of the graves. Where did they go? Well, later on they went with Jesus to heaven, where God is. See, they weren't part of being present with the Lord. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's after Jesus had completed the work of the cross because if you think about it, the final payment for sin hadn't been made. That sacrifice in heaven had not been made. So now when you die, where do you go? You go to heaven. Before when you die, you went to paradise, which was a... You know, paradise obviously is not a derogatory term. It's not a bad place. It's a good place. But you slept in Christ there. In other words, when your body went into the ground, you went to paradise and you were being reserved there for the work of the cross to be completed. Now, study Luke 16 and you'll see that. I want us to understand that the kingdom of heaven is a concept and if it's spoken of as something that already existed, when Jesus is... Uh, when Jesus was on earth, that he's not talking about literally the city of New Jerusalem, if you will, or the place, heaven. He's talking about God's economy. Get that? In other words, if you were to, say, if you were to put it this way, in a way we can understand, you'd say the economy. God's economy, or in other words, the part being part of God's economy. You know, you could be part of a different, uh, you know, uh, uh, of a system, or an economy, right? Or excluded from the same thing? Does everybody understand what we're saying? Okay. I just confused everybody. Let's let's subtract the word economy. Okay. Uh, let's use the word system. Let's say the system of heaven. In other words, the God's system. Unless you know Jesus as your Savior, my friend, you're not part of God's system, God's economy. Uh Matter of fact, if you were to read in chapter 8, you'd see, and again previously, that many people say, Lord, Lord, but Jesus says, don't know you. If you were to read chapter 10, when, and we'll be there next week, you'll see where Jesus 
get, takes his disciples and sends them out two by two. And he gives them power to cast out devils and to heal uh, the sick and to do particular things. And you'll see that one of the people that Jesus gives power to is a man by the name of Judas Iscariot. And he's a man that had access to Jesus and even had God-given power to heal and do miracles, but he wasn't part of the kingdom of heaven. It's interesting, isn't it? And so when Jesus says something, and you'll see it as you study Matthew, like the kingdom of heaven is like, or when something is being described, Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is trying to help us to understand this is the way God thinks. And a lot of times the way God thinks is different than the way man thinks, and that's why we have an illustration. You're Americans here for the most part. All of us are at least in America. and We have a certain way of thinking. And I recognize that the people who try to divide us, try to divide us, uh, don't think this way. But I do, and I trust that you do as well. Um, I believe in equality. Don't you? I love it what our documents in our country say that... We are created equal and we are endowed by God, by our Creator, with certain inalienable rights or rights that should not be violated. Now there are people that anytime you have people, people do wrong and you do wrong. You've been wrong before. All of us have. But the reality of it is that is in Christ Jesus, we're all equal. And honestly... If you were to believe the people that are anti-American that report on us, you'd think America is the most hateful place in the world. But I would encourage you to go somewhere else and see if things are as equal in other places as they are in America with regard to opportunity, with regard to individual treatment. Uh, a fellow by the name of Andrew, some of y'all met him a couple of months ago. He's from Johannesburg, uh, South Africa. And he was here, and he said, it's amazing to me he said, when I listen to the news, he said, there's all kinds of, you know, he said, people are, there's all kinds of, quote, racism reported on in America. He said, but they don't have racism in America. He said, I've been here for two weeks, and he said, I've never seen anything like it in my life. He, was, he said, I'm at a conference of peers, and there are people from all different backgrounds in the conference, and he said, we're all equals. He said, in Africa, we don't speak. He said, he said, in Africa, if you're black, you don't talk to a white person. If you're white, you don't talk to a black person. He said, that's the way it is. You know, he said, I just can't believe in America that, you know, we just have, you know, people, you say, Pastor, is, that, is, is it everything the way it should be? No, it never is. But it ought to be for Christians. It ought to be for believers, oughtn't it? Because God made us all one in Jesus Christ. So when we look at a passage where Jesus is eating with publicans and sinners, and then the Pharisees come to him and say, why are you eating with publicans and sinners? We think that's wrong. We actually, we object to that, don't we? We object to them more so than we object to them, than we agree with them and their thoughts about Jesus. Isn't it true? And so, would you put yourself, would you put yourself in a different perspective just for a little bit. Uh, just not because it's right, because it's actually wrong. But just to see where they're coming from and to see what a big deal it was and how different Jesus was than what they thought he should be. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago when we saw Jesus had the centurion come to him and he said, my servant is sick, and Jesus' response was, I'll come and heal him? And we don't think very much about that. But... If you were to see it from Matthew's perspective, who is as Jewish as he can be, whose worldview is so radically changed because of the way that Jesus presented himself to Matthew, you'd see what it, Matthew's trying to emphasize. Matthew's saying, this Roman soldier, who every Jew hates, had the audacity to walk up to Jesus and ask for his servant to be healed. 
And from Matthew's perspective, it's assumed that everybody there would say, what is that man, what does that man think he's doing? Jesus is king of the Jews, not the Romans. The Jews hate the Romans, and Jesus is Jewish. And so Jesus hates the Romans. And so when Jesus said, I'll come and heal him, to the centurion, this is different. This is not what we would think that the king of the Jews should do. See, he should be saying, make the Jews great again. <laughs> As opposed to anyone else in the world. He ought to be against everybody else. But actually, Jesus' simple answer was, I'll come and heal him. I'll come and heal him. In other words, Matthew is saying to us, the Gospel of Matthew is saying, Jesus loves everybody. And the value of a Roman centurion, Jesus actually used him for an example of faith. When he said, when that man said, when Jesus said about him, I'm sorry, I have not seen so great faith in no not in Israel. And he said, there are going to be people that come from all the nations that are going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the people, the children, their children, they're going to be cast into outer darkness where there's weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Jesus emphasized that it's faith that matters to God, not your heritage. It's faith that matters to God. You remember when Jesus said, Think not to save yourselves, I will raise, or I mean, I'm a, you know, I have we have Abraham to our father. He said, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Friend, let me just say to you, it would be a good idea for you and I to not think that our heritage is what's going to justify us before God because it isn't. It doesn't impress God. We see another one of those passages here in this story in Matthew chapter 9. So, so let's, let's look at it. Let's look at the question, verse 11. The question was, the second part of verse 11, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Why does your ma master eat with publicans and sinners? You know what a publican was, right? Tax collector. Even today, tax collectors are evil. How many of you all would vote to abolish the IRS? Would anybody here, let's just, let's just pick on the person who disagrees with us. Would anyone here not vote to abolish the IRS? You're not going to say, <laughs> even if you would. Okay, all right. So we don't think positive of ta positively of tax collectors, do we? Uh, <laughs> so the reality of it is, is that this guy's a tax collector. And more than that, more than that, it's assumed that we know that he's corrupt. Honestly, there are corrupt officials in the United States. Did you guys read the news last week about, was it, uh, is it Dania or Hollywood, the mayor? Hallandale. Hallandale, thank you. Hallandale, the mayor of Hallandale, was arrested for taking bribes or kickbacks uh, this, just this last week. Or, yeah, arrested, actually arrested and being investigated by the FBI, taking a one-time $8,000 in a Dunkin' Donuts bag. I wish I could find $8,000 in a Dunkin' Donuts bag sometime. But literally, uh, some Russians... <laughs> ironically, uh, paid her for rights, you know, for development, to, to get to develop these. This is really a major corruption scam. It's really bad. And I'll be honest with you, that doesn't, as much as you say, oh, that happens all the time, it doesn't happen all the time because there's major consequences for it. Her life's over. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, she's in serious problem. But you know, in other countries, it's normal to bribe government officials no matter what. You go south of the border, and I'm not, I'm not bashing, I'm just stating facts. You go south of the border, and you want to drive somewhere, you better have bribe money because the police will arrest you if you don't. They'll pull you over, and if you don't give them something to let you go, you'll be in jail. A lot of countries like that. Most countries are like that. You want to export or import something, you don't know what the fee is going to be. It's going to be less if you bribe somebody. It's going to be more if you don't because they're corrupt. Those are publicans. Those are publicans. People that are corrupt, that shake people down for their money. We know the publican that got saved, Zacchaeus, right? His, his account's actually given just a little later. And he was a tax collector. And when he got saved, he said, I'm going to restore everything that I stole. So, I mean, he just straight up confessed. Everybody knows I'm a thief, and I'm going to give people back uh, this many times what I took. So... He 
got right. He was a publican. So the question is, why is Jesus eating with corrupt people? Why is Jesus eating with corrupt people? And when you look at it from that perspective, it is a good question, isn't it? In other words, God, God in the flesh, that's who Jesus was, was dining with, going to the home of, befriending publicans and sinners. And the question is why? Why does Jesus do that? And before we excoriate the Pharisees, let's just say it's a good question. Let's just be honest about it, right? We think you should treat everybody equally, but these people, wouldn't you agree, have lost or given up their right to be treated equally? Like, I'm not for treating uh, murderers equally, are you? I don't think murderers ought to have the same rights that I do. Do you? Uh, thieves, I don't think should be treated equally, should they? Well, Pastor, you shouldn't lock thieves out. You should just let them go where they want and you know, do whatever they want. You shouldn't treat them differently. Well, they've done things that have taken away their right to be treated the same. So the question is more valid, actually, than we acknowledge on the outset. That's why I want to take us through the thought process. I want us, first of all, to realize when we look at a passage like this, we instantly judge the Pharisees. But first of all, we don't come from their perspective. They come from the perspective that anything not Jewish, I'm against. And they also come from the perspective of, you know, we are, we are law-abiding. That is, they actually cared about not only God's law, but Jewish law. We're law-abiding. We're upstanding citizens. And these guys evidently, obviously, are not. You, you, honestly, the, the notion of saying honest publican is like, you know, saying honest politician to an extreme. It's an oxymoron. The two words don't, they just don't go together. There's no such thing as an honest publican, and everybody knew it. If there was an honest publican, he would have lived in a normal house, but he had a nice house. If there was an honest publican, he'd have lived on a normal salary, but he shook people down, he had a lot more money than everybody else. There's no such thing. Why did Jesus eat with the publicans and sinners? And here is the simple answer to it. When Jesus heard that, he said, that. They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. He said, because they need me to. <laughs> why do you, Jesus, why do you communicate with, why do you fellowship with sinners? And he said, because they need me to. I don't know about you, but this is one of those, oh, moments. It's one of those moments that actually touches my heart. You ever have things that, ever have things that just touch your heart? And you, you internalize and you personalize them instantly? I don't know how many times I've read, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick, and I think I need a physician. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now I will remind you that because of the perspective here, there are people that miss out on the opportunity to be healed of the thing that's their greatest need. See, the last time, not last week because they preached last week, the last week we looked at when the man who was sick of the palsy, his friends brought him to Jesus, that Jesus said, Thy sins are forgiven thee. And then he was questioned about his right to say something like, Thy sins are forgiven thee. And he said that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed and walk, or go into thy house. And Jesus healed the man, but the man's need was what? Forgiveness of sins. My friend, we're all sick of sin. We're sin sick. And the tragedy in this passage of Scripture is not that the Pharisees had this perspective. I think it's a valid question. Jesus, why are you eating with this kind of people? It's a valid question, I think, don't you? The problem is the category that Jesus put them in when he answered the question. He said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. And I asked the question, had I rather be whole 
or sick. Would I rather be whole or sick when it comes to needing Jesus? Do you realize that most people go to hell because they think they don't need anything? They think they're just fine. I don't know how many people say, leave me alone, I'm just fine. The problem is that they are not. Let me ask you a practical question. Have you, have you ever sinned? Ever? Could you just be honest enough to say at least that at least one time you've sinned? I, I'm telling you, I have met people that have told me, I'm not a sinner. And I've said to them, have you ever sinned? And they said, no, I haven't. Fortunately, they're almost always next to someone who knows them. I've, I've had husbands say, I'm not a sinner. And I always say to the wife, did you know that? <laughs> It's amazing how wives know their husbands are sinners. I've heard ladies say, I'm not a sinner. I'm a good person. I'm not a sinner. And I say to their children, did you know that? <laughs> Listen, if you don't know you're a sinner, you're the only one. It's your lie and you've believed your own lie, but you're the only one that's believed it. God's Word says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And my friend, it's not just true because God said it. It's true because you know you're a sinner. And it's tragic that individuals would come to Jesus and fit in the category of not needing a physician, not because they have not sinned, but not needing a, a physician because they think they haven't sinned. Friend, you can't help someone who thinks they don't have a problem. It's true, isn't it? Yeah. I'll tell you what, they're here right now. The homeless folks, they're here. They're in... They're in South Florida. Not the ones that are regularly here. I'm talking about there are hundreds of, there's thousands of new people that have come to Florida because of how severe the winter is everywhere else. Last week, I've been accosted by, I'm going to say at least five individuals that, are, that, that want money. They don't want help, but they want money from me. And at least five last week. And I don't give money to people to buy alcohol. The Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I actually know places that'll help them. I could actually connect them with people that would help them with their problems to be able to get them out of their situation. But the problem is, is that their situation almost universally is not their fault. They are a victim of last week, two guys. The reason they were homeless is because people wouldn't give them good jobs. I asked, him, I asked one guy, what's your qualification? He told me what his qualification was. I said, you ever have that job? He said, yeah, I did. I said, what happened to it? No, he lost his job. He's a drunk. That's why he lost his job. He couldn't, couldn't uh, control himself. He's out of control. He couldn't keep a job. It wasn't the job's fault he's a drunk. It's his fault. I want to tell you something. He'll probably die. Statistically speaking, he'll probably die a drunk in a really tragic way. And it's really hard to watch and see. It's heartbreaking to watch and see it. But he can't be helped because he doesn't have a problem. You know, there are a lot of really functional people, though, that you don't notice their problems. They drive fancy cars and live in nice houses, and they're exactly the same. They're just functional in different ways, but they've got the same problem. Their problem is they don't have a problem. They don't need anything from anybody. You know something? We all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Who's sick? Who is sick and in need of healing? Every person who's ever been born is dead in their trespasses and sins. We all are. We all need Jesus. And the tragedy of this question is not that it's asked because it makes sense and the answer to it was an answer we all need. And so if they hadn't asked, asked it, you probably would have or I would have. It's a question we all have. Why does Jesus communicate with this kind of people? And it's because that's the kind of people that know they have a need. 
sinners. And if you know you're a sinner, my friend, you are so close to being whole. Not from your perspective, but actually whole. A person who knows he's got a problem is a person who can actually get help with his problem. A person who thinks he has no problem is a person who will never get help with his problem. And that's what Jesus is saying. He said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repent to repentance. Now think of the irony of this. Is anybody righteous? The Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. There's none righteous. So does Jesus here say, now you good people, I didn't come to call you to repent. I came to call him to repent. Is that what he's saying? No, it's not what Jesus is saying at all. But the problem is, is that even if he told them, you need to repent, they'd say, repent of what? We're good people. I keep the law. I'm a Pharisee. I do this and this and this and this and this. I don't need to repent. And the tragedy of it is that Jesus cannot save you. Can't save you. Can't heal you. Why? Because you don't have a problem. Do you not actually have a problem? No, you actually do. But you don't think you have a problem. That's practical for a person to acknowledge their need for a Savior, isn't it? So you'll never be born again. You'll never actually pray to Jesus. You'll never say to God, God, I'm a sinner and I want Jesus to be my Savior, unless you realize you need one. You'll say, well, I've always gone to church. I've always been religious. I have this, 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 and this. Therefore, I don't need. And the problem with that is that if you don't have a problem, You'll never be healed of your problem. But you actually do have a problem because you are a sinner and you need to be healed. You know, believers, though, we can relapse into the same kind of a mindset. A lot of Christians relapse, don't they? I'm not talking about believers that sin. We know believers sin. First John explains that very, very clearly. He's talking to believers. And it says if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us, his truth is not in us. We're all sinners even after we're born again, even after we're saved. And that's not what I'm saying. But you know what a person who thinks other people are bad and they're not? Talk about born again Christian. One of the one of I think the most obvious signs that a person is not living right is that it's so easy to see how other people aren't living right. Don't be afraid to talk to me and think, well, Pastor thinks it. Well, maybe you should be a little bit afraid. Okay. Because everybody does have an opinion, right? Sometimes I'm honest and I tell you what my opinion is. But uh, people do have an opinion. But uh, don't be afraid to say, well, Pastor, you know, I saw this going on with somebody. It's not my point, what I'm talking about today. But you know, a lot of times people come to me and it's like over and over and over again, they tell me what's wrong with other people. They come and say, Pastor, this person, da 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 That guy, he's got a real problem with. And they talk about the guy's problem. That lady, she's got a real problem with. And I understand if somebody needs help, you know, Pastor, we need to help this person. There's, there's something going on, we need to help. When somebody's always telling me about everybody else's problems, I mean, it's like they're, you know, like they're a, uh, you know, a hunting dog. You know, and they, you know, they point, you know, and everywhere they go, it's like, found one, found one, found one, and they start pointing out all the sinners everywhere. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, you realize, you know what, this person wants to see everybody else's sins, they don't have to look at their own. And you know something, it's just been my experience, and that's true. It's been my experience that usually it's a beam and a moat kind of a thing. Whereas they've got a beam in their eye and they're trying to get a speck out of someone else's because we have that characteristic. We have that tendency. And we're just like... I'm talking about saved people now. We're just like the Pharisees that came and asked Jesus why in the world He was trying to help the publicans and sinners. Because we think we don't need help, they do. Let me tell you what we all need. We need to need Jesus.
friend of mine sometimes says this. He says, you know, one of the toughest things, one of the most uh, revealing things about myself that I realize is when I don't, I can't think of anything to pray for. He said, when I don't have anything I'm praying for, it exposes the reality that I don't think I need anything. And he said, I realize that's when I have the greatest need. When I think I don't need God to do this, and I don't need God to do that, and I don't need, and I don't need, I don't have any problems. He said, when I'm actually honest about it, I realize that's when I have the most things that I need, when I'm the neediest. And you know something? This is an amazing truth about Jesus, but I found that God, God loves a beggar. He just does. God just responds to beggars. Matter of fact, there are all kinds of commands in Scripture where Jesus says, Ask, ask, ask me. A lot of times we think God's going to do something for us because we don't need something. And that somehow God's impressed by that. But actually what moves God is our need. And you know, I'm not going to tell you what, but I'm just full of needs. I'm a very needy individual. And when I acknowledge my need and I go to the Lord, I realize how needy I am. And I'll tell you what it does. It brings me to a place of dependence. And that's one of the best things that will ever happen to you, my friend, is when you realize your need and you depend on God. You say, God, I can't make it without you. God, I've got a problem. God, I'm a mess. I need. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus every hour. What do we ever? I need Jesus. I'll tell you, I'm trying to be nice this year, and I was mean to Charlie at the end of Sunday school today. Did y'all hear it? I need Jesus. I need God's help. I came into the end of Sunday school hour today, and, and Charlie said, any questions? I said, when are you going to quit? Was that nice? No. It was not nice. I need Jesus. I was telling you, just, just being honest about things, you realize, wow, I need, man, I got a problem. You know, we need a little humility. We need to see our needs. You'd be amazed at the place God will take you to if you recognize that you're needy. You'd be amazed at what God will work on your life, the way He'll develop you, the place He'll take you to, if you just recognize your need. You'll never be born again unless you recognize that you need to be. And my friend, you'll never get help from God unless you recognize that you need help. Why isn't God doing anything? Why isn't God... Well, I'll tell you why. Because He doesn't help people that don't need help. That's the answer. God doesn't help people that don't need help. And if God isn't helping you, that's why. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Father, we thank You for what we've learned today. Lord, I pray rather instead in our hearts of rebelling against the truth. Lord, that You would just break every one of us, our, our will, our stubbornness, our unwillingness to acknowledge our need and bring us to a place where we'd say, you know, I do need to be born again. I'm more a publican. I'm more a publican than I am even a Pharisee. And I'm glad because at least I know I need Jesus and they couldn't see their need. God, for those of us here today that are more Pharisaical, we, we look at people and we think, well, they've got problems. Lord, would you help us to understand that the people with problems are the ones that get help? And that we all have a problem of sin. And we all need help. God, our need today isn't circumstantial, it's spiritual. It's not just for people around us to be different, it's for us to be changed. And the only way for that is for us to receive Jesus as our Savior. In just a minute, I'm going to finish my prayer, but I would like to ask that out of respect for every person here and for privacy's sake, that you would keep your, your eyes closed just for the until I finish my prayer. Would you do that? Would you close your eyes? If you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I wanted to hear the message today, but I did. And the truth of it, I don't even like you. You could even say that. You say, I don't like you. I don't like the way you preached it. But the truth of it is just real. I don't see, I tend to not see my needs. 
I tend to think that other people have problems, but I don't. But actually, if God were to judge me, I'd die in my sins because I've never seen my need for a Savior. Today I've seen that need. Would you pray for me? Don't embarrass me. Don't call me out. But would you pray for me? I know that I need Jesus to be my Savior. Would you just slip your hand up? That's you. Just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. Don't embarrass me. Don't call me out. But I know that I need Jesus to be my Savior. Just slip it up, slip it right back down. Okay. Second thing this morning. Pastor, God knows my heart and He's kind of shown it to me today. I actually tend to be a Pharisee when it comes to thinking that other people have problems but that I don't. And I realize that people that don't have problems don't get healed. With God's help, I'm going to acknowledge my needs. I know Jesus is my Savior, but I tend to look at other people, much like the Pharisees look at the publicans and sinners, and I can't understand what God sees in them because they're so bad. I'd a lot rather be a publican and a sinner from that perspective than a Pharisee that thinks that he doesn't have a problem. As God helps me, I'm acknowledging my problems, and I want healing. Would you pray for me? Don't embarrass me. Would you pray for me? I'm acknowledging my problems. I'll just slip your hands up and right back down. More like a Pharisee than I am a publican, and that's a problem. God, I'm so thankful that you're gracious and you're merciful. Lord, when someone like a Pharisee asks, What do you see in them? <laughs> you just show us that we're just like them, we're all sinners. God, when we see someone who's terrible like a publican, and we wonder what you see in them, we recognize that you're a physician who sees someone that you can heal. And God, as individuals have acknowledged their need today, may there be healing in the invitation hour we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to open our blue hymn book up. We're just going to we're going to sing a song of invitation this morning. And if you'll open up uh, to page. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong number there. <laughs> Can't find the page I was looking for. I think it's 242, and I was thinking 422. Yes, 242, thank you. Good close, Mrs. Dollins. You got me on the right track. My mind does that. I, so, page 242, if you'll stand if you're physically able to, we're going to sing Jesus I Come. And I think that every person here between you and God could just internalize the words of that song and make it personally true for you that you would come to Jesus. And let's just have an opportunity and an invitation to do that. Jesus, I come to Thee.